All right, good day everyone, and tonight we're doing a little bit of a strategy discussion for Phoenix Point. No actual gameplay, but with all the new people who've come into the game now that it's available on consoles, how exciting. I thought it would be good, especially since the recent patch has also changed a lot of the meta around the Geoscape, to step back and do the basics and talk about, instead of battles or weapons, um, the Geoscape level, the map level, the strategic layer of Phoenix Point, um, some of the strategic drivers involved, and I've got a collection of 10 tips and discussion areas that I want to go through to help you sort of win the game on the strategic map layer. Because at the end of the day, while the battles in Phoenix Point are really important, just like the really old XCON games, more than the newer ones, um, the game really is won or lost on the strategic layer. If you lose a game, um, maybe it's because a battle goes wrong, but a lot of people I'm noticing in comments um, and on the Reddit and on the Discord are losing this game even though they're never losing any particular battle. Just eventually the strategic map gets ahead of them and the Pandorans evolve too quickly and they find themselves in difficulty. So let's talk strategic tips. Before I jump into it, I have one question you need to ask yourself and one principle to keep in mind that ties all of this together. Before you start a game of Phoenix Point, decide whether or not you're going to cheese the run or not. Um, specifically, this has to do with the inventory system. If all you're out for is to get the easiest and simplest win possible, it is possible to play a game of Phoenix Point with a lot less, uh, a lot less economic hassles. What you can technically do is after any, for any given mission, because you only are ever flying one mission at a time, is strip all the gear off one set of soldiers and then teleport it over to another set of soldiers that might be on the other side of the world. And as a result, if you do that, you only ever need nine sets of gear. You only need nine primary weapons, nine sets of armor, whatnot. Um, it fundamentally changes the economics of the game. If you play like I, and I think most of the player base does, wherein you try and equip all your soldiers and don't teleport items around willy-nilly, um, there are a lot more economic demands on you. So decide at the start, because if you're listening to my tips about how to optimize your economy and thinking, wow, why do you need that many resources? Um, it makes sense if you keep in mind the fact that I don't cheat not cheat. I don't cheese the equipment system. The second thing is this general principle. Um, speed is king. In Phoenix Point, more than so many other strategy games, speed is king. You, you don't want to take your time because speed, getting out there running missions, is what gets you resources, it's what gets you diplomacy points, allies, it's what advances the story, it's what knocks back the Pandorans' ability to fight you, because Pandorans get stronger the more bases that they have unchallenged. And those bases exist all over the world, even if you haven't discovered them. So if you're not spreading across the world, satellite scanning, defending havens, you're going to lose human population faster, the Pandorans are going to build up their fortifications and structures, and and you're going to be correspondingly weaker at every stage of the game. Activity, so getting teams out there, scouting and running missions, is how you get ahead. It's how you get the bulkier resources. It's how you make the story advance. It's how you win this game. So with that general principle out of the way, let's go through my major tips for the strategic layer. The first thing, you've jumped into the game for the first time. First tip, your absolute primary goal at the start of the game is to get a second team up and then to get a third team up. The more teams you have out there, the faster you're going to scan sites, the faster you're going to loot resources, the faster you're going to build up diplomacy points. Speed is king. So you'll start the game with one squad. That squad may or may not be fully complete depending on which difficulty level you play on. You'll have one manticore and a collection of soldiers. If you're on a super high difficulty, you might want to complete squad one first, but your absolute first priority, rather than building buildings, um, activating additional bases, your first priority is to get additional teams in the air and get them out and scanning and exploring sites. The way you do this um, is by either recruiting personnel through the recruitment tab, which recruits Phoenix personnel into your base, you research Haven recruitment protocols, which as soon as it becomes available, it's a very early game research, it lets you recruit from Havens, you get that research as soon as possible, and you send teams out, you discover scavenging sites, and some of those scavenging sites are going to give you the chance to um, rescue independent soldiers who will then join you at the end. There's also now a fourth way to get recruits ever since the most recent patch, and that is if you're defending a Haven like I'm about to here, um, if you 
manage to save the lives of some of the local defenders and their positive relations with you, they might join you. Some of them might join you at the end of the match. So more troops is almost always the answer early on. And with more troops comes more aircraft. And this leads into um, my second point, which is your air fleet is almost as important as your roster of troops and the type of aircraft you're using matters. Um, you start the game with one manticore, one of these guys, a medium speed six slot transport. That's the Phoenix Project aircraft. As this game goes on, every team you send out is going to need between one and two aircraft, plus you're going to need at least two aircraft probably that are on air combat duty, and you may need additional aircraft on trading or mining duty. So, should you just rush in and manufacture manticores? Probably not. Manticores and aircraft, as a general rule, are horribly expensive, and the manticore is a middling option. What you really want at the start of the game for your second and third team is to get these things, the Synedrian Helios, up and running and fill them with five-person squads, if you're confident enough running missions with five five people, to get those and get them running. The reason you want these smaller, faster aircraft, and if you can't do five troops, eventually you might do what I do, and you combo two and transport to the same mission and deploy eight, which is the maximum limit for most missions, is because most of the time that is wasted by squads is actually spent flying from place to place. So if you have five troops, or even at worst case scenario, you have eight troops in a tier mark, the Tiamat is flying around at absolute slow as molasses. Um, it's going to maybe get to one site, search it, and do one mission in the time a Helios squad can do two to three, which means you may as well have three times as many troops. There are huge savings involved in flying faster. So in the early stage of the game, here's what you want to do. The new diplomacy system means you take greater negatives with a faction, the more positive your relations are. So the cheapest raids are ever going to be is at game start. So I would still grab one or two of these Helios aircraft from Sinedrian at the absolute start of the game and go for a three aircraft fleet. That's enough to get Alpha, Bravo and Charlie squads up and running straight away. You might also want to hit either Anu or New Jericho once each, maybe, um, when the relation levels are still pretty cheap. And that gets you um, a reserve Thunderbird and also a Tiamat. The Tiamat can go around trading, but your actual air, your Manticores and your Helios can be what fly your main troops around. As the game goes on, you're probably going to want to either acquire extra aircraft, either by raiding, which is much more expensive now, or you may now be in a position where you actually want to manufacture vehicles. One thing I'll say as a middle option between these, and it depends what difficulty level you're playing. At different difficulty levels, look around the map. At the start of the game, all of your unactivated Phoenix bases are already on the map. You already know where they are. I think once you do Phoenix Archives, it's one of the super, super early researches. They'll look like this, gray, and you can activate them remotely and the cost goes up each time. So you pay a certain number of materials and tech, base activates. Some of your bases, unless you're on Legendary, have manticores at them for free at the start of the game. So if you activate that base, you just get that manticore. So that's a great way to augment your aircraft strength. So if you're playing on normal, you pick up two manticores for free. You raid two Helios, a Thunderbird, and a Tiamat at the start of the game. That gets you up to six aircraft, which is pretty, pretty handy so far as um, additions go. Um, so that would be my big tip. Your air fleet matters. Your air fleet matters because it's going to get your teams out there. It's going to be doing your trading. It's going to be doing your scouting. And later on, if you're playing Festering Skies and ignore it if not, they're also going to be doing your air combat. And it's ideal to have air combat being done by aircraft that aren't carrying your troops around because they can just stalk the behemoth and shoot people down. So that was tip two. Make sure your air fleet is up to date and focus on using the faster platforms to move your troops around. Slower platforms are for things like trading, or in the case of the Thunderbird, because it's really tough, they're good air combat platforms. The third tip I want to go into is don't overbuild bases and don't fall into the traps that I've seen people fall into time and time again. There's a lot of base slots. 
a lot of base slots, and you have a lot of bases in Phoenix Point. Um, if you look at the number of bases I have activated right now, there are 13 bases on the map. I don't think I've activated all of them. In fact, that may only be the bases that I've activated. There may still, I know there are some that I have not activated yet. For most of them, you can see, even when I'm swimming in resources and I'm at the 22nd of the first, so I'm getting into the, I'm well into the middle game. I haven't built up most bases. Most structures, if you play a lot of strategy games, even the first XCOM game was like this. Um, someone, who, a really greedy build, a build that wants to boom for the late game, is actually all about investing money in your structures, your economy, rather than more troops and combat power. It's completely the opposite in Phoenix Point. Structures are something you build the bare minimum of at the start of the game, and you put all of your resources into getting more troops out there. The trap structures. Actually, let's talk about non-trap structures first. What are the what are the non-trap structures? Well, when you activate a new base, the non-trap structures are the vehicle bay, which you want if you need to increase the aircraft limit. So if you need to get this number up so you can have more aircraft, I'm at 11 out of 20, so I have too many vehicle bays, but you can get that number up if you need to. The energy generator needs to be active if anything in that build, that base is going to use power, which is almost any base. Then you need a satellite uplink. Satellite uplink is the last basic necessary all base should have one structure because satellite uplinks detect sites which you search and searching sites gets you resources. So actually, satellites make you a profit. They're also how you find Pandoran bases and destroy them. So everything needs a um, satellite uplink. Beyond that, don't overbuild. Don't rush into more fab plants. Don't rush into more research labs. I am super happy with four and four fabrications and research. And this is in the middle game, and I didn't rush to build these. You will get some of these pre-built in the bases you activate. So going to build them from scratch costs more is takes longer and isn't really efficient. Um, and even then, I would say fab plants are even less important probably than research labs a lot of the time because you might not have the resources to support a faster manufacturing queue early in the game. The biggest traps that people in over, over invest in is one, food production is the worst. There is a research that you can get from the Disciples of Anu uh, not food harvesting. Anyway, there's, there's a research out there that lets you build food production facilities. And people who get nervous looking at this negative number next to food can build huge numbers. And I see guides on, on Reddit and Discord that say, oh yeah, have a designate a couple of bases, maybe one or two, and fill them with farms. And that'll then you can trade that in order to make a profit. Don't do it. It takes months for food production facilities to break even, let alone turn a profit. And if you're playing quickly, you can win this game in like two months. The resources are much better spent on things that are going to make more of an impact in the short term, whether that's troops, whether that's weapons, whether that's bases and satellite arrays. It's always, yeah, it's always a bad idea. Similarly, overbuilding mutation labs to produce mutagens. No. Um, you get most of your mutagens by capturing Pandorans and melting them down into mutagens. Um, archaeology labs are good because they're what get you all your ancient resources. Um, putting medical bays and living quarters in all bases is unnecessary. It's unnecessary. Um, you only need them in a couple of bases around the place so your troops can rest and um, heal in between missions if necessary. And that's only if you don't have hibernation pods deployed. If you're in a Helios, it's pretty quick to fly around. So it's often better just to go back to a base which has two living quarters, so you get double fatigue refresh, rather than going somewhere local. And that means you can probably demolish a lot of the unnecessary infrastructure and get a little bit of a refund. So those are the common traps. Uh, the other thing is don't put training facilities in anything other probably than the one base. I like a little training crash so that all your new recruits go here and pick up a few levels before you deploy them to a team. But beyond that, I wouldn't overinvest in them. There are so many buildings in this game and most of them, you just really want to be careful how many you build. Um, Living quarters, you'll build one extra one in your starting base, probably for extra fatigue refresh, and then you'll never build another one. You'll repair the ones that you find along the way. Um, stores, if I was really hard up for resources, I would probably destroy most of my stores because I have way too much item storage. 
most of my gear is issued, I don't need a huge item storage. So that's my tip number three. Don't overbuild bases, and in particular, uh, farms are banned. Food production is banned. Which leads to point four, demolish and scrap if needed. So a lot of these bases, when you turn them on, are going to come with structures you just don't need. Feel free to demolish them. Like, knock them over. If you have way too much storage, knock down some storages. And there are other structures you can build as well. Living quarters, you might have too many, you're never going to use the base as a refresh. You can knock them down if you need extra resources. Um, this would be worth some resources if I knock this down. 125 mats, 5 tech, that's a weapon. And a partial, um, a partial ref uh, refund for the cost of activating bases, which early on is pretty cheap, you can do a pretty good job knocking down the existing structures. Similarly, absolutely useless uh, equipment that you're never going to use. Um, you won't have much of it at the start of the game, but you will acquire useless gear that you're never going to use. You can go into this scrap item menu and you can scrap stuff. You can see here some aerial combat equipment can be pretty profitable. Armor. Mm. You're probably going to issue all your armor, but some of it can be complete crap. For example, independent heavy armor. I would scrap. And then once you go here, especially once you start rolling out higher tech stuff and you're never going to need the lowest tech stuff again, you can grab some quick resources, scrapping equipment that you never think you're going to use. If you're just a not a flamethrower kind of guy, you don't like it, scrap the ammo, scrap the weapons, um, go for it. So demolish and scrap if needed. It's one way to get resources. Um, being loot crazy is the flip side of that coin, which is uh, just loot, use, recycle, everything you capture. So, in the start of the game, uh, you can, let's just turn on Assault only. You'll find a lot of people who drop, like, these sort of weapons, these independent weapons. They're nowhere near as good as even your ones, let alone the New Jericho or um, Sinedrian weapons, let alone the Tech 2 or even Tech 3 weapons you get later in this game. But, if you steal them, loot them, use their ammo supply, and use them to keep your troops running until you can get more weapons later, it's a nice stopgap. Um, a dude with a gun is a lot more effective than a dude without a gun, even if it's this crappy one. Keep in mind also that since the patch, you can actually manufacture these independent weapons ammo, so you can keep them running. And they're very cheap. Like, it's 15 mats to make 30 rounds of that. Um, 21 mats, 1 tech. This is cheaper ammo. And that applies to all of the independent weapons. So you can keep them running, and eventually, when you want to retire them, you can keep them in storage or you can melt them down for a few extra resources. The other thing I'll say is, um, when you go into scavenging missions, coming home with everything is preferable. And when you go out on missions, coming home with everything is preferable. A lot of missions, if the, generally if the mission type says you're going to have to evac at the end, you have to manually loot items that are dropped in order to bring them home. And loot dropped from enemies in those sort of missions can be critical. When you're doing your first and probably only with the new meta, Haven Raids in the early game, um, the faction equipment that is dropped in those raids and also in story missions where you get to fight the other factions without any loss of reputation um, those weapons will stand you in good stead for a long time and as long as you don't do something silly like reverse engineer them um, you should be able to use them until you get to the point where you start unlocking faction tech and that leads to point six let's talk about research the priorities and the pitfalls. So research. Research is critical. The way you end the game, um, if you want to get the good endings for this game, all you need are really good research, a way to get to Antarctica, and one of the factions to be allied with you, so you can then complete their story missions. To get a bad ending, all you need is good research to get to Antarctica. You don't even need to be allied with a faction. You can end the game that way. So research clearly matters. Um, what I will say, though, is more than building a, a billion research labs, the secret to getting ahead in research is knowing what not to research. There's a lot of traps. Phoenix Point has a very, very large research tree, and an awful lot of it can, at least in my view, be safely skipped. For one thing, reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is whenever you capture an item that you can't presently manufacture. So that's usually a piece of faction equipment. Uh, here we're looking at the purification grenade. You can spend, so requirement to start, one of one, this will destroy the item, 
and give you, after you've finished researching, give you the ability to manufacture it. This is a trap. This is a trap because if you were to reverse engineer every item in the game, you'd spend most of your game just reverse engineering stuff. And considering that the factions share their technology over time anyway, as you move up the diplomatic rankings, which you should do, you should become friendly with the factions, you're going to get the tech for free, or close to. Certainly much cheaper and not requiring you to destroy your items. So it's better if you focus your tech on things that are not reverse engineering. The other thing I'll say is that there are immediately useful tech categories and there are skippable tech categories and there are story um, categories. A lot of researchers um, unlock the very extensive tier 1.5 sort of tier weapons in the game. So this is most of the autopsies and a lot of other research which unlocks a lot of mid-tier Phoenix project weapons. Also, if you have good relations with a faction, like if you're allied with them, you can help research some of their tier two technologies. So an example here would be incendiary technology, one day, four hours. Armor piercing technology, one day, 17 hours. And that's with four research labs and the Synedrian plus 50% research boost. Um, I don't need most of these weapons because despite the fact these are all tier two gear, by this point in the game, I'm starting to deploy tier three gear because tier three gear operates on a completely different tech tree. It requires you to fly your guys around the map, clear these ancient sites, um, build archaeology labs, do archaeology probing, and do a couple of story missions to get the blueprints. But then the actual research items are pretty short, and the price of the items is mostly paid in these alien resources, which you get by building a bunch of archaeology labs and getting the sites. We'll talk about archaeology labs in a moment. So, I'm not sure if this is controversial, but I think it's entirely legitimate to skip the vast majority of techs in the game. Like, the vast majority. I would do the initial compulsory story research. I would get Haven Trade and Haven Recruitment Protocols. And then I would push my way through the story research, the ones that the research that advances the story, the research that unlocks the um, legacy of the ancients text. I'd go get the blueprints. I'd research the blueprints. I'd clear the ancient sites and I'd deploy a bunch of tech three weapons. And I'd let the factions do most of the faction research for me until I get to the allied stage. And then I'm only going to do allied research stuff for things that are either going to help me cover more of the map or things that are going to help me end the game. So uh, that's the story research for whatever faction I happen to choose. So if you're doing Synedrian, Project Domovoy might be one example, which is where you go to the moon, spoiler. Um, but all of these here, Pandoran Physiology, Arthron Autopsy, Triton Autopsy, Chiron Autopsy, like there's some resources in here, but there are days and days and days worth of research that I have safely skipped and will continue safely skipping. Like... I'm not going to go straight into advanced melee weapons. I'm not going to go straight into advanced laser technology because I'm going straight to deploying tier threes and that's good enough for me. Um, also, I wouldn't prioritize faction researchers um, if you don't want that faction to advance quickly, noting that the collapse in diplomacy between factions seems to be partly tied to their progress down the tech trees because the factions lose opinion of each other as they develop their tech. So it might not be worth pushing them too fast too quickly, especially if you might go hostile to them occasionally. So that's the research. That's what to research, which is recruitment, trade, story, and ancient tech. Um, and it's what to skip, which is most autopsies, because most autopsies just unlock mid-tier equipment, most faction research that just unlocks tier two weapons that you'll replace with tier threes. Um, that's a lot of what you can skip. Tip seven. Tip seven is another way to help pay for everything. Tip seven is trade is profitable. So if you have spare aircraft, you can have them flying around and trading. What do I mean? Well, there's a rule here. You can go, when any faction, any haven you have positive opinion with, will let you buy any resource that it produces for any resource that it doesn't produce, okay? Also note that this alert level thing, this is new. This means that you can't chain attack factions repeatedly. Um, cool. 
So this Anu Haven, for example, I can trade materials for either food or tech because it produces food and tech and it doesn't produce materials so I can trade. And you can see here, here, this relationship, materials to food, is four to six. That's a profit. If I go over to a new Jericho Haven that sells materials, you'll see here they'll take four food for six materials. So it's super profitable to just sell at one, take what you bought, and sell at the other. You can make a profit. The only way to not make a profit is to buy tech from non-Synedrian factions and then sell it to Synedrian. That's the only way to lose money. If you want to make them, if you care about efficiency, the most efficient things, Synedrian sells the cheapest tech, Anu sells the cheapest food, and New Jericho sells the cheapest materials. But if you bounce around the map constantly, you can have an aircraft turning hundreds of resources a profit. Um, in the same time, almost equivalent to what some of your scavenger teams will be making, just picking up all the trade goods as you go around. So, trade, awesome. The other thing that's awesome is having a wide footprint. So having as much of the map covered by satellites as possible. Why? If you have covered an area with satellites, if a haven within that is attacked, so if you've discovered a haven, you'll be able to defend it. You'll get resources, you'll get opinion, but also if the Pandoran base that attacked that haven, because Pandorans always come from somewhere, if the ones that are attacking that location are within your satellite scan range, you will detect them and you'll be able to go destroy that base for additional opinion and loot. So that's good. Um, so this pattern that I have of having really wide coverage maximizes the number of areas that I have to loot because the satellites discover areas for me to explore and loot. It allows me to discover all the havens to defend them and it lets me find out when there are Pandorans operating in the mist so I can destroy them in order to get more diplomatic opinion. So that's why footprint really matters. Um, one of the things I said there that helps is that it helps improve your diploma uh, diplomacy. This used to be a little bit different. So you want to get, uh, you want to improve the relationship factions have with you. Uh, being hated by a faction is bad. It means you can't trade at their havens, and if you get really, really bad, uh, they actually go to war with you and they raid you, and it's just, it's just not a good idea. By contrast, at 25%, 50 and 75%, not only are you steadily unlocking additional benefits from the factions, you're getting story missions from them that unlock the next diplomatic tier, and those missions can be really profitable. Um, they can give you significant rewards in terms of resources, as well as giving you skill points and all the other benefits. And because a lot of them are fighting against other factions, but you don't lose opinion from them, they're a good opportunity to get faction loot as well. So you want to get as much opinion as possible and getting your footprint open so you can defend havens and destroy Pandorans is the best way to do it. It used to be that you could take these missions. These missions are now a bit of a trap. It used to be that raiding um, factions gave you a net profit in opinion. That is, you would lose less opinion with the faction you were raiding than you would probably gain with the one you took the mission from. That's really no longer the case, especially as your opinion gets higher. Like you will, you will probably lose far more reputation than you are gaining. The situation gets a little bit better as the factions hate each other more because as they hate each other more, you get more positive opinion for attacking the other factions, but it's still a losing proposition. And in fact, I would argue you want to finish the game before they go to war with each other because you're interested. You might not be, but if you're like me, interested in winning the game with as much of the human population still alive as possible, it means keeping havens alive, and that means stopping the human factions from destroying each other. So, raiding these, these diplomatic missions, they're traps. Um, I wouldn't do them anymore. I would only do the diplomatic story missions. If I have to raid someone, it's not going to be for a diplomacy mission. It's going to be because I need an aircraft and it's the start of the game. And that faction is Sinedrian twice, New Jericho once, and Arnu once, probably. That's probably the new meta. I'm not entirely sure on it yet. But once you get up to a good level of relationship, 
you need to decide who you're going to try and end the game with. This means getting to allied state with that faction and then committing to that faction and only that faction's end of story research. If you're interested in what exactly those are and you want the spoilers, you can go look up the tech tree. But each faction, if you want to finish the game with them, you have to research a specific set of texts that they will share with you. And you basically need to help them finish the research and then do some story missions. That's the faction you're going to want to push to allied and then start doing its joint research. You probably will get to allied with all three factions, I think still, or at the very least you might end up with like 85, 75, 50 or something, some sort of combination thereof. But you want to know who you're going to push to that level first. So those are my sort of easy takeaway strategic tips. The final one I was going to add was um, the parallel economies. And the parallel economies are the capture economy and the ancient tech economy. These are ways to basically artificially supplement the resources you're earning. The capture economy basically means when you capture Pandoras, they go into your alien containment and you can melt them down and turn them into mutagens. Mutagens are useful for a whole bunch of things. If you're playing Corrupted Skies, they have huge numbers of uses and even if you're not you can use them with mutation labs or to make mutogs and using them to make uh, mutations on people so if we go here uh, i don't have my mutation lab ready but you could use mutations instead basically you're spending mutagens to replace an armor piece which basically means you're turning mutagens into food and other resources or if you've researched the harvesting tech, you can turn them into food and trade them directly. So it's a parallel economy if you need more resources. The second parallel economy is the ancient tech one. And this is a bit of a hassle, I admit, but it can be really, really profitable and you can unlock it pretty quickly. So what you have to do for this one is I would build four archeology span labs as soon as you unlock the archeology span lab, which base has all my archeology span labs. Four is the magic number. Oh, and I'm actually building a number five. There you go. Where is the base with all the Arco Labs? Here we are. One, two, three, four. The reason you unlock those is because it makes archaeology probes super cheap. So these get reduced by a percentage for every archaeology lab you make. By the time you've bought the fourth one, they're manufactured in like an hour and they cost two tech and eight materials, which means you can cover the entire map with archaeology probes. It's this little button here, you can drop them out of aircraft and it picks up these antediluvian sites. Clearing an antediluvian site, as well as unlocking this economy, gives you a thousand materials for every one you clear. So they're pretty profitable to clear. They're difficult missions, but they're profitable to clear. The new change is Whenever you have an ancient resource site under control, even if you're not manually mining it, you generate one of that resource per every archaeology lab per tick. And that can be that can be quite a lot. That can be a significant income and it encourages you to um, clear even more of these sites. So you want to discover them with archaeology probes. You want to then start excavating them and then you want to clear them as rapidly as possible in order to unlock these resources, which then let you manufacture a whole bunch of ancient tech weapons, which in terms of materials and tech are much cheaper than the tier one and tier two weapons available. They have no ammo costs, so they significantly reduce the maintenance involved in running your top level teams. Plus they're incredible. Like the Scorpion is better even than the tier two sniper rifles, the armor piercing New Jericho gun or the Virophage rifle. It is super damaging and super piercing and it's more accurate than either, while also not having super expensive ammunition and limited clip size. It's just a better gun and that applies to all the ancient tech weapons. The Rebuke is in a class of its own for explosive weapons. So running that parallel economy significantly reduces the strain on your tech materials and food. So you can use those for things like activating bases, getting more troops up or manufacturing, you know, aircraft, resources, whatever it is you need in order to fight the Pandorans. So there we are. Those are my, those are my 10 tips. Um, they all come into the category of basically how to move faster, how to earn more, and how to save on things. So what you can cut from your build order and what you should prioritize in your build and strategy order. But that's the essence of what I would propose. More teams quickly, an aircraft stable, um, not overbuilding your bases, 
demolishing things that you don't need, which is an extension of not overbuilding, loot everything that isn't nailed down, skip the research that you can afford to skip, trade like mad, build your international footprint, get friendly with the factions so that you can trade and do those profitable story missions, build up your parallel economies in the form of these alien resources and mutagens from captures to if you really want to maximize the resources available and by that point you'll have the ability to cover the entire globe you'll have multiple teams running around the place you'll be able to afford if you want to to manufacture additional aircraft to fight the fight the festering skies events if you need to you'll be spoilt for resources and you'll go into the final missions of the game a quickly b with a lot of the population still alive um, and C, being able to afford to kit out whatever alpha squad you send in with the absolute best equipment money could buy. Anyway, I wanted to keep it pretty basic, um, but those are my answers for what are the 10 top 10 tips I've got for Geoscape strategy. Hope it's helpful. Any questions, put them down in the comments. Happy to answer. And if there's any deep dives I need to go into in any of these systems in the future, just let me know. Chisel.